Chapter 13. Visit. One of the Cherub staff dropped Lauren off on Saturday morning. James was barely out of bed when he heard the doorbell. Happy birthday, he said, giving his sister a hug. You made double figures, the big one zero. Lauren smiled. I missed you, James, for some strange reason. They walked inside. Everyone was wandering between the kitchen and living room, munching on triangles of toast. Joshua was shuffling down the hallway on his bum. Lauren had never seen him before. Ooh, she said. Aren't you cute? What's your name? Joshua gave Lauren an odd look, as if to say, oh God, not another kid, and started bawling for Zara. Hey, you it, James shouted. There goes your theory that Joshua likes anyone with blonde hair. Lauren wandered into the living room, threw off her bomber jacket, and sat on the couch. Kerry and Kyle wished her a happy birthday. So, Lauren asked, where's all my prezzies? Actually, James said, I haven't got you one yet. <sighs> Typical, Lauren huffed. Well, now that I'm a bona fide drug delivery boy, I thought you might like to spend my ill-gotten gains. James burrowed down his jeans, pulled out a fistful of scrunched up banknotes and dumped them in Lauren's lap. Lauren grinned. How much is this? She straightened out the notes and started counting. 20, 40, 60, 80, 110, 15. Wow, how long did it take you to make 115 pounds? Four nights, James said. The only thing is, if you want me to take you shopping, you'll have to pay my bus fare. I've only got 60 pence left. Is there a gap near here? Lauren asked eagerly. I want some new jeans. And a Claire's accessories? If there is, I can get those cool black hair scrunchies like Bethany's got. Can't you just use an elastic band? James asked. Lauren ignored her brother and glanced at her watch. What time do the shops open? Oh, calm down, you idiot, James said. The money's still going to be there in a couple of hours. Why don't you go in the kitchen, get some toast and say hello to Zara and the others? Whatever. Lauren said. But let's go early. The shops get really busy on a Saturday. Zara dropped the kids at the Reeve Centre. James hoped that none of the security guards remembered him. Why are you wearing those sunglasses? Lauren asked. James shrugged. Oh, am I? Oh, oh, I've got to take them off. You look like a right twit, Kerry said. It doesn't have anything to do with the five PlayStation games you've got stuffed under your bed, does it? Kyle asked. What were you doing spying under my bed? James asked indignantly. Remember Monday, before school? Kyle asked. No. Kyle mocked James's voice. I can't find my PE shirt, Kyle. Will you help us look for it? Oh, yeah, James said. That. So let me guess, Kyle said. You don't want to go anywhere near Game World. But if he stole them as part of a mission, he's allowed, isn't he? Lauren asked. He's supposed to give the proceeds of any crime to charity, Kerry explained. Well, he should give them to charity then, Lauren said. You're not on this mission to make a profit, James. Does that include the birthday money in your pocket? James asked. Oh, Lauren gasped. <laughs> yeah, James giggled. That shut you up, didn't it? Normally, going around the girly shops would have driven James mad. But being the big brother treating his sister felt good. Lauren, who wouldn't be seen dead in a skirt, got two hooded sweatshirts in Gap, a pair of faded jeans and some silver stud earrings. She treated everyone to lunch in the food court and even got James a pair of novelty socks as a thank you. He was never going to wear the ghastly things, but it was a nice moment when she gave them to him. After lunch, Kerry went off to meet Dinesh. She told James to give Zara a message that she wouldn't be back until after dinner. Kerry being with Dinesh pissed James off but he didn't want to spoil Lauren's birthday, so he tried not to think about it. When they got home, Zara had ordered a fancy cake. The icing was camouflage green, and there was a miniature assault course built out of marzipan, with a climbing tower, a water jump, and toy soldiers running around. The iced message around the edge said, Happy birthday, Lauren, and good luck in training. Joshua thought the cake was a toy, and kept lunging out of Ewitt's lap towards it. After Lauren had blown out her candles, Everyone sat around the table, cracking up at the huge mess Joshua made with his tiny piece of cake. Lauren was tired out by half nine, 
and James decided to go up to bed with her. She started off in a sleeping bag on the floor, but she decided it was uncomfortable and climbed in with James. She'd always got into his bed when they were little, but they'd grown since those days. This is ridiculous, James said, wriggling up to the wall so she had more room. I'm still scared about training, Lauren said quietly. I don't even see the point of it. You'll understand after you've done it, James said. Training's horrible, so when something tough happens on a mission, instead of being scared, you remember that you've been through worse and you can handle it. Sometimes, Lauren said, just thinking about it makes me feel like puking. The fear is worse before training starts, James said. Once you're there, you're too worn out to think. There was a knock on the door. Yeah, James shouted. We're awake. Zara pushed the door open and stuck her head in. James, when Kerry left you earlier, did she say if she was going anywhere after she left Inesh's? No, James said. I rang their house, Zara said. Dinesh said Kerry left before eight. She ought to be home by now. Did you try her mobile? James asked. That's the first thing I did. I even sent a text. Maybe we should go out looking, Lauren said. I wouldn't panic yet, Zara said. She'll probably turn up. You two get some sleep and try not to worry. A mobile woke James up. He'd forgotten Lauren was asleep next to him and bumped into her as he sat up. That's your tasteless ringtone, he said, giving her a kick. I bet it's that idiot Bethany. Lauren got out of bed, flicked on the light and found her phone inside her jacket. James looked at his clock. It was gone midnight. Hello? Lauren answered. Kerry, wow! Everyone's looking for you. Hang on, yeah. James is here. James snatched the Nokia off Lauren. Kerry? Oh, thank God, Kerry said. Why did you switch your phone off? It's probably gone flat, James said. I couldn't get an answer from Kyle, or Nicole either. I tried Lauren as a last resort. Where the hell are you? James asked. Zara's going frantic. She's sitting downstairs waiting for you to get in. I'm outside Thunderfoods. I need a huge favour. What's Thunderfoods? James asked. Dinesh's dad's company, Kerry explained. I think I'm onto something, but I need you and one of the others to ride out here and give me a hand breaking in. Why don't you explain everything to you at or Zara, James said. They'll know what to do. Because if I'm wrong, I'll look like an idiot and they'll boot me back to campus. James couldn't refuse. After all, he spent half his life telling Kerry to be more relaxed about rules. Okay, he said. What is it you want? I'd like Nicole or Kyle to come as well. Kerry said. Nicole's at her sleepover. Kyle's out partying. But I'm here, Lauren said, sounding excited. James looked at his sister. No way, you're not trained. It's better if there's three of us to search, Kerry said. But two is okay. I need you to bring some stuff. Torches, your lock gun, your digital camera, and some beer. Where the hell can I get beer at this time of night? Even if there was somewhere, I'm too young to buy it. There's a few cans in the bottom of our fridge. Kerry said. Sneak one out. What do you need beer for anyway? James asked. James! Kerry snapped. I don't have time for 200 questions. Get the stuff, get on a bike and ride your butt out here. James took down directions and ended the call. What's happening? Lauren asked. God knows why, James said. But Kerry wants to break into some food factory. She doesn't want you at all Zara to know what she's doing in case she's wrong about whatever it is she thinks is going on. He stepped into some tracksuit bottoms and trainers. I'll go get the beer for you, Lauren said. Thanks. Lauren crept down to the kitchen while James churned through the mess under his bed and got his lock gun and camera. He grabbed Kyle's camera in case they needed to and took Lauren's phone because his was flat. Lauren came back with a cold beer. Thanks, James said. It's going to be well hard, sneaking my bike out of the garage without you at all Zara noticing. Lauren started putting on clothes. What do you think you're doing? James asked. You're not coming. No way. Kerry asked for a third person. You're not trained. I'll ride along, Lauren said. If Kerry doesn't want me, I'll look after the bikes. James knew how stubborn Lauren could be. He didn't have the time or energy to argue. Fine, he said. But don't think I'm taking the rap for you if we get in trouble. I'm 10 years old, Lauren said proudly. I can make my own decisions. Chapter 14. Curry. 
There wasn't much traffic, but what there was drove dangerously fast. It took 20 minutes to ride across to the industrial park. Thunder Foods had a full car park and lights on everywhere. The factory worked 24-7, sending out truckloads of chilled pastas and curries to supermarkets. Kerry led them into an alleyway between two warehouses. Are you sure you want to do this, Lauren? She asked. We could get in serious trouble if we're caught. If you want me to help, I'm up for it, Lauren said. So what's this about? James asked. I got more information from Dinesh, Kerry explained. It's amazing what you can wheedle out of a boy if he thinks you're up for a snog. Did you snog him? Lauren asked. Kerry laughed. <laughs> no chance. James was relieved. It was worth being dragged out of bed at midnight just to hear that. Anyway, Kerry said, Dinesh doesn't get on with his dad. He reckons Mr. Singh is a hypocrite when he tells him to behave and do his homework when he's a crook himself. So I go, how is your dad a crook? And Dinesh starts explaining how his dad nearly went bankrupt and KMG bailed him out. I said I didn't believe him. Dinesh tells me there's a storage building at the back of Thunder Foods production plant. He says he's been inside and seen bags of cocaine. Security seems pretty lax. I've already sneaked right up to the warehouse door, but I can't get inside without my lock gun. What if there's a security system? James asked. There is, Kerry said smugly. You need a swipe card. She pulled a plastic card out of her shorts. I nicked this one off Mr. Singh. And what about the beer? Lauren asked. We need a cover story, Kerry explained. If we get caught, we act like kids who got drunk and decided to cause some mischief. Kerry took the beer off Lauren. She pulled the tab and swallowed a few mouthfuls, then dribbled some down her t-shirt. It's more believable if we've got the smell of drink on our clothes and breath. James took the can off Kerry and did the same. Lauren hated the taste and spat hers in the gravel. I don't want to get beer on my new top, she said. Give us, James said. He snatched the can off Lauren, poured most of it on the floor, and splashed the dregs over her hair. Okay, Kerry said. Don't forget to act drunk. They staggered through the Thunder Foods car park, keeping behind the cars. Then it was over a stretch of lawn to the side of the warehouse. James handed Kerry his lock gun. You're quicker than me, he said. Kerry fiddled with the lock while James and Lauren sat on the grass yawning. It was an eight-lever deadlock, one of the trickiest kinds to pick. You want me to try? James asked. Kerry sounded edgy. You won't do it. It needs a different attachment. She unscrewed the back of James's lock gun. There were nine different shaped picks inside and it was tough to tell them apart in the dark. This one or bust, Kerry said, clicking a different pick onto the gun. She rattled about for another half minute. Finally, she sighed, pushing the door open. The alarm pipped until she swiped the security card. They couldn't turn the light on in case someone saw it through the windows. It felt spooky, shining their torch beams around the cavernous black space. The racks of metal shelving were filled with sacks and tins of ingredients for the factory next door. Maybe that's how they get the cocaine into the country, James whispered, disguised as curry powder or something. No, Kerry said. Dinesh described clear bags filled with white powder, and he said KMG people came and did something with it upstairs. Kerry, James said, I hate to say this, but maybe your little boyfriend is just trying to impress you. This building doesn't even have an upstairs. We should split up, Kerry said, deliberately ignoring James. There's a lot of shelving to cover. They each took a row of shelves and started working along, searching for the white powder. The shelves went up 10 metres, you need a forklift to access the higher bays. Lauren whispered to Kerry between the rows of shelves. Come look at this. Kerry dashed over. Lauren's torch shone on a few clear polythene sacks filled with white powder. Borax, Lauren said. It's what you mix with pure cocaine to make the weaker stuff they sell on the street. How do you know that, Miss Smarty Pants? James asked. I read your mission briefing, Lauren said casually. James tutted. Lauren, do you know how much trouble you could have got in if you'd been caught reading someone else's mission briefing? Lauren laughed. <laughs> well, less than the amount you'd have been in for leaving a secret briefing lying on your bathroom floor. James, Kerry gasped. You're not even supposed to take briefings out of the mission preparation rooms. I know, James said, shrugging. But I usually smuggle a few bits out to read while I'm on the toilet. Kerry took photos of the borax. So... Keith Moore stores his borax here, James said. 
There's nothing illegal about borax. Mr. Singh will just say they use it as disinfectant. There must be more to it, Kerry said. Keith wouldn't bail out a company this size in return for shelf space. Dinesh set about upstairs. I hate to keep saying it, James said, but there is no upstairs. Yes, there is, Lauren said. This building has a pointed roof, but the ceiling in here is flat. Good thinking, Lauren, Kerry said. You obviously got all the brains in your family. There must be a loft up there. The three of them pointed their torches at the ceiling. The beams got dim over such a distance, but they eventually spotted a hatch that had to lead into the loft. How can we get up there? Kerry asked. Easy, James said. It's like a computer game. If you look, the shelves in some bays are closer together. You can use them like a ladder. And we thought all those hours on the PlayStation were wasted, Kerry said, smiling. Lauren, you stay down here and keep lookout. Me and James will climb up. Lauren nodded. James doubted she'd have been so agreeable if he'd been giving the orders. They clambered up the closely spaced shelves, feeling their way with their hands. They walked along the shelves, stepping over sacks and tins, until they came to the next easy-to-climb section. Lauren shone her torch on them, lighting their path as best she could. The top level was 15 metres above ground, but the shelves were 3 metres deep, so it felt safe. There was a wooden pole with a hook on the end for undoing the loft hatch. Kerry pulled it open. James shone his torch into the hole while she pulled out the ladder. It clattered down, banging against the metal sheet on which they stood. The hundreds of fluorescent tubes in the ceiling a few centimetres from their heads started plinking to life. James and Kerry dived down and shielded their faces while their eyes adjusted to the light. What the hell did that? James whispered. Someone must have come in. Kerry said. They'll never see us up here, but where's Lauren? They crawled to the edge of the shelves on their bellies. James leaned over one side, Kerry over the other. I can't see her, Kerry said. It looks like she had the sense to get out of sight. There were two sets of footsteps, accompanied by women's voices. James caught a glance of them. They were both fat, wearing hairnets and dark blue overalls. Bay 46, one woman said. They walked slowly, reading the numbers printed on the shelves. Potassium carbonate, the woman said, leaning into the bay. This is it, in the blue drums. Something whomped against the floor, echoing around the warehouse. James peeked over the side. A sack of orange powder had exploded on the ground, almost directly below them. Lauren must have knocked it off a shelf. The two women started walking towards the spill. I better see if Lauren's okay, James said. Kerry nodded. Be careful, keep out of sight. But when he turned around, Lauren was crawling along the metal towards them. Why didn't you hide behind something? James whispered angrily. Sorry, Lauren said, looking ashamed of herself. I wanted to be with you guys. Even though it was tense, James couldn't help smiling. Now you know why you need training, so you don't get scared so easily. I wasn't scared, Lauren said defensively. Just... Kerry anxiously shushed the pair of them. Shh, you're making too much noise. Down at ground level, the two women were standing by the burst sack, hands on hips, staring up at the ceiling. We must have a ghost, one woman grinned. The other one laughed. <laughs> well, I'm not sticking around to see if he chucks another one at us, and it's not going to be Muggins here who cleans that mess up either. The women picked up their boxes and switched out the lights as they left. The three kids kept still making sure the women were gone and letting their eyes readjust to blackness. Kerry lit her torch and shone it up the metal ladder. Bet you a pound there's nothing up there, James said. Kerry didn't find him funny. There better be, after all this messing about. She went up the ladder first. There were no windows in the loft, so it was safe to switch on the lights. Even before James got up the ladder, he could tell they'd found something good from the grin on Kerry's face. Kyle woke up at 3.30am, in a smoky room, snarled up with sleeping bodies. He didn't know if he'd passed out, or fallen asleep, or what the stain on his trousers was, but he remembered it was the wildest party of his young life. The host would be grounded for a year when her parents got back from the Lake District. Kyle had hammered himself with alcohol and thumping music. Now he was suffering. Anyone else would have crashed back to sleep, but Kyle wanted to get home, have a shower, and put his clothes in to soak. He'd always been neat. 
One of his earliest memories was of chucking a tantrum over going onto a beach with a load of other kids because he didn't like getting sand on his clothes. It took Kyle a while to find the room where he dumped his sweatshirt. He got abused when he trod on some naked guy's ankle in the dark. He stepped over more kids crashed out on the front lawn as he went out of the front gate towards the bus stop. He waited 40 minutes for the night bus, which dropped him on the wrong side of Thornton Estate at half four in the morning. Everything looked wrong as he stumbled towards the house. All the lights were on, and there was a grey Toyota he didn't recognise parked on the drive. Nicole wasn't home, but everyone else was in the living room. Lauren had dropped asleep on the couch. Ewitt had his laptop computer on the coffee table. A balding man in a suit and tie sat next to him. What's going on? Kyle asked. Did I miss something good? Yeah, James grinned. It turns out bringing Kerry on this mission wasn't a dumb waste of time after all. Kerry gave James a look, but she was too full of herself to get offended. Zara introduced Kyle to the stranger. This is John Jones. He's in charge of the MI5 task force that's targeting KMG, so we called him over to look at the pictures. John Jones reached over and shook Kyle's hand before speaking. You kids are amazing, he grinned. When Dr. McAfee offered me a cherub unit, I thought it was some kind of joke. James looked surprised. You must have heard about missions where cherubs have done a good job. John shook his head. I've been an MI5 agent for 18 years without ever hearing of cherub. Zara explained. Thousands of people work for MI5, but only the most senior ones know about cherub. People like John only find out if they have to work with us. Even then, John said, there are 43 MI5 agents working on Operation Snort, and I'm the only one who knows about you kids. So what's happened? Kyle croaked, his throat raw from the smoke at the party. Come and look at the pictures James and Kerry took, Zara said. Kyle leaned over the laptop screen while John Jones explained what had been photographed. KMG smuggles in cocaine at a very high purity, 90% or more. The stuff that gets sold on the street is between 30 and 50% pure. What you see in these pictures is a production plant. The pure cocaine gets mixed with borax and some other stuff in those aluminium vats. Then, John Jones clicked on the mouse, changing to a different picture. The machine in this picture is a real beauty. It must have cost over 50,000 pounds. It's designed to package seasonings like soy sauce or pepper. You turn it on, load up a roll of polyurethane bags and tip your powder or liquid in the top. This one has been set up to package one gram bags of cocaine. So did you find much coke? Kyle asked. None at all, Kerry said. There could be drugs hidden in the warehouse, John said, or somewhere else on the Thunder Food site, but I doubt it. Most probably, a couple of guys turn up with a few kilos of cocaine, spend a few hours mixing and bagging it, and then take it away with them when they leave. So, Kyle asked, are you going to bust this place up? No, John said. We're going to put it under surveillance. We'll get an undercover team to rig the loft up with video cameras and microphones. We'll watch who comes and goes, and where they're coming from and going to. Hopefully, we can track the drugs that are processed at Thunder Foods back to wherever they're being smuggled in. So it's really only the beginning, James said. You kids have got our foot in the door, John said. That's not the same as bringing down KMG but it's going to be a lot easier now we know where their cocaine is being processed. John shook everyone's hand before he left. The sun was on its way up, and Lauren was the only one who'd managed any sleep. It was three in the afternoon when James surfaced from under his duvet. He was busting for a pee, but Kerry was in the shower, merrily singing her head off. Lauren had left a note on the kitchen table. James, you looked peaceful. Didn't want to wake you up. See you soon, Lauren, XXX. James was miffed. He'd wanted to say a proper goodbye and wish Lauren luck in training. He sprinted back upstairs as soon as he heard Kerry unlock the bathroom. Oh, it took you so long, James gasped, lifting the toilet seat and starting to pee without bothering to close the door behind him. Sorry, Kerry said, toweling her hair. Have you seen Ewitt or Zara? Not yet. They're at the supermarket. They want a word with us later on. Kerry said. You think we're in trouble for not asking before we broke in? James asked. Well, Lauren got a blasting from Ewitt before she left. Was she upset or anything? Kerry shook her head. She seemed to handle it okay. So what do you reckon they'll do to us? 
Kyle overheard Ewan and Zara talking, Kerry said. Apparently, we've landed ourselves washing up duty for the rest of the mission. James shrugged. Eh, we could have got worse, I suppose. 